In this video, I'm going over three stocks that I think in the coming months, years, and decades will see substantial and sustained growth. With valuations currently down, uh, I see these stocks as potential sales and good entry points for investors seeking to further diversify their portfolio. I'll analyze why each security presents as a good long-term investment and going over their balance sheets and their business operations to support these claims. The first company I want to talk about is an absolute powerhouse in the fintech industry and a company that I really see long-term good growth potential from, a company you're probably already aware with, Square. Square is most recognized for its POS or point of sales in small retailers and storefront merchants. When the health situation took place in mid-March and most storefront retailers were forced online, Square stock took a major hit. The stock dropped over 54% in less than a month. Being perceived as largely tied to the hip with storefront merchants, many investors backed out, uh, fearing little to no income generated from their POS system. I personally think this was an emotional panic sell-off and that most investors hadn't priced in Square's other various business ventures. For years, Square has been investing in lesser known side ventures completely unrelated to their POS systems. Square owns Cash App, Square Capital, and they also have an online e-commerce store. Since about mid-March, these three ventures have massively benefited from the health situation and have seen an increased surge in usage. Cash App reported a Q1 earnings increase of 115% year over year, and I can only see this trajectory really continuing. They saw a quick rebound in share price in the following months, almost back to their 2018 high. The stock price has increased over 100% since March lows. Um, so if you got in before that, you're absolutely laughing. But if you haven't gotten in yet, I don't think it's too late for you. Square is uniquely positioned in that it's essentially hedged against itself, um, operating in both spheres to the sale of goods. On one side, they have their cash app and their e-commerce platform. And on the other side, they have their typical POS system. Square is run by CEO and founder Jack Dorsey. Uh, you may have heard of him. He runs a small startup called Twitter. Uh, he was also the CEO and founder of that. Heard of it? I really like Dorsey and I trust his management experience. Um, he's done a fine job running Twitter, I think. I see this company as a really forward-thinking, sleek company willing to try new things and invest in low-cap fintech startups. So diving into the balance sheet, uh, we can see that Square has seen a steady increase in total net revenue a 44% year-over-year increase, and a Q1 gross profit of around $539 million. Uh, this represents a 36% increase year-over-year. Year. Square did, however, suffer a Q1 net income loss of $106 million. However, as the economy continues to open up, I imagine this will be close to, if not already bottomed out. Square is a large cap company with $39.7 billion in outstanding shares. They have a large 52-week delta with a high of 92.96 and a low of 32.33. And current share price is actually up since the initial crash, uh, hovering around 90. Their forward PE ratio is 133, which is incredibly high, and also a price to earnings growth ratio of 6.31. Its price to book is 21.39, which is also very high, suggesting that the stock may be currently pricey compared to their earnings. Square has a profit margin of about minus 1%, a return on equity of minus 3.68%, and a current liabilities to assets ratio of 1.68. You might be thinking that this is a horrible balance sheet, and in many ways it's not the prettiest, but I think with the economy continuing to open up, uh, the increased demand for Square Capital and the Cash App, um, I think Square is actually sitting in a really good place, and I really do see endless growth prospects for Square. Another note is that Square's GPV, or gross payment volume, has also been increasing as more businesses lean towards curbside pickup and delivery. Square Capital, a loan distributor, a uh, subsidiary of Square, has been aiding businesses in a payment protection program, lending capital to businesses that are in need. Uh, they'll be receiving interest on these. Square has also gained approval to open up its first bank in 2021. This will essentially cut out the middleman in many of Square's operations. They won't have to rely on banks giving them the loan first, which they then give to businesses they can act directly. This will improve their profit margins greatly. Square has really been focusing on building momentum within North America 
and they're focusing on emerging markets in the future, which they see as potential strongholds. Emerging markets tend to lack pre-existing POS systems, and with Square kind of moving in with their all-in-one, helping businesses out in every sort of way, um, the growth prospects for emerging markets and developed European markets are huge. I really like this company, uh, their diversification within FinTech, their management team, their ability to take risks, try new things, and I think it's going to be a really good company for the future. I see this as a powerhouse in the world of fintech. The second stock I want to talk about isn't actually really a stock. It is a REIT or real estate investment trust. A REIT you can kind of think of like an index fund sort of where there's a parent company holding many different subsidiaries. Uh, this case it's just in real estate. Although REITs in particular have taken a major hit since the lows seen in March, uh, there are exceptions to this. One of my favorite REITs right now is a company called Welltower. And what makes Welltower so special is that it focuses on healthcare infrastructure. I really wish I had filmed this before Friday, which is currently today. Um, they have seen a massive, massive, massive valuation increase today. Um, so it's not too late for it. it. You can see that investor interest is growing, um, but today has been amazing for the stock and it's likely to continue to do so. Going through its holdings, you find that a large allocation is dedicated to SHO, post-acute providers, and healthcare systems around US, Canada, and the UK. It's currently trading around $58 per share, uh, with a 52-week high of 93 and a low of 24. This is a major change, or delta within the year, uh, which shows volatility. Um, however, they have extremely low beta of 0.23, so it's showing that it's typically not volatile, but this year is just presenting different concerns and uncertainty for many investors. However, in the coming months, I can see this REIT being quite volatile, so just weather it out. Don't worry if the stock's going down. Remember, these are long-term gains. Their PE ratio, or share price to earnings per share, is sitting at 20.75, which is slightly on the high side, and its earnings per share is $2.80. Their forward PE ratio is about 40 and they have a peg of 9. Its price to book ratio is fairly low at 1.42 which is decent for growth investors. They are showing a profit margin of about 22% and a return on equity of about 7.5%. This is on the low side but I think this is uh, specific to this year and I can see these stats increasing in the coming months and years. Well Tower currently invests in 586 SHO properties or senior housing operations. They're expecting a decline over the next few quarters. However, I'm confident these will bounce back after the health situation is under wraps and extra precautionary measures have been implemented. While you may be thinking that real estate is not the place you wanna be in right now, I don't think this applies to healthcare infrastructure. It's invested into long-term assisted living facilities, post-acute facilities, as well as international hospitals. These types of facilities have taken many extra precautions during the past few months, whether that be um, increasing PPE, increasing labor wages, and it's because of this that their balance sheet is in the state it is right now. Well Tower decreased their 196th consecutive quarterly dividend to 70% of its original worth to 61 cents per share. However, it's still sitting at about 4.15% dividend which in this market is pretty rare. Wells Tower has consistently increased dividends um, over the past 10 years, making them a dividend aristocrat. So it was a big deal for them to cut this dividend, and I can see as soon as they actually can, restoring this high dividend yield. Their current goal is to simply reduce operating expenses and to increase the liquidity that they can just inject into their system in case they need to do so. We can see 2.2 billion in available borrowing, 603 million generated from sale of shares, and they just closed on a two year $1 billion loan. All of this gives them $3.803 billion in liquidity that they can infuse into their company as soon as they need to do so. This will provide them with a nice safety cushion that they can use to weather through the storm as long as it may take. Well Tower has really seized the moment of low interest rates and many sales on investments. They recently closed on 16 outpatient units. Uh, these aren't going anywhere. They closed on three senior living facilities in Las Vegas, and they just signed a joint venture agreement with Invesco worth $491 million, along with other long-term property deals. Their total assets increased by about 2.3 million since their Q1 of 2019, 
And unlike a lot of other REITs, their rent has stayed extremely stable at 97%, as the majority of their rent comes from capital already saved, usually in the form of retirement funds. I really like Welltower long term. People need hospitals, people need acute cares, seniors need senior housing, um, and I really can't see cuts coming to this type of REIT anytime soon. With a rapidly aging population, I can see these only really growing in importance. So if you're looking for a stable REIT with a high dividend yield um, in comparison to many other REITs, I really do see Welltower as kind of a safe haven for your money. Okay, here we go, number three. Whether or not the world is in crisis mode, there is one thing people will need no matter what, and this is their drugs and their pharmaceuticals. Regardless of world events, pharmaceuticals and people's medication will be a necessity. Not only do I think big pharma will remain relatively unscathed in the coming years, um, but I think its importance will increase by the general public and there will be an increased demand for new drugs and new therapies in the coming years and decades. Pfizer remains one of the world's largest big pharma companies. Um, it's almost unfathomable how big they actually are. Their market cap is $200 billion and they experience extremely low volatility with a beta of 0.65 a 52 week high of 44 and a low of 27. This relatively low delta through the mid-March periods that we saw um, shows that big pharma companies are gonna be relatively unscathed by this health situation. Their PE ratio is about 12.66, which is fairly average and they pay out a respectable dividend of 4.22%. Also, dividends are really hard to come by right now and I think anything above four and kinda of under seven is where you wanna be. They have an earnings per share of about 2.8 with a forward PE of 12.77. Their PE to growth ratio is 2.72 and their price to book is 3.09, which shows that the price may be somewhat overvalued. They have a great return on equity of 23.7% and their current ratio is 0.90, showing more liabilities relative to assets. Pfizer is extremely diversified. It's, it's almost shocking going through their holdings. They, they own literally everything medical you could ever imagine. Glass companies to make beakers and vials, medicines, cancer research, immunotherapies, clinical trials. The list really does just go on. They recently invested 500 million into small and medium sized biotech companies. These companies are currently working on vaccines in all sectors of medicine, including research into the current health situation. In a very uncertain market, I see healthcare and healthcare infrastructure for that matter as safe havens for money and something that's not gonna go away and it's not fluctuating depending on how many people are currently working. They are a dividend aristocrat with 10 years of consecutive growth and distribute dividends on a quarterly basis. I really do think Big Pharma is somewhat undervalued right now as I don't think the future potential and stability of pharmaceutical companies are priced into the stock currently. If the market stagnates later in this year, large cap, federally backed healthcare companies will continue to prosper, especially because the economic shutdown was fueled by a health implication. I really like Pfizer due to me thinking that it's undervalued and that it's a current safe haven for potential growth and a good dividend yield that I don't see getting cut anytime soon. All right guys, thanks for watching. If you like my content, you can go back and watch the other videos. I really do hope you took my advice in the first video I made as two of those index funds have greatly increased in valuation just today alone. If you're unsure what an index fund is or index funds to choose, uh, you can go back and watch my other videos where I highlight uh, three really good index funds. So please like and subscribe. I know it's cringy to say, but I really would appreciate it. I'm going to be analyzing more stocks, more business operations in the coming days, weeks, and months. So if you're interested in investing or potentially starting to invest, uh, hit that subscribe button. It would mean a lot to me. I'd really appreciate it. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.